Hey everyone, I'm Mr. A, and today we're going to talk about finding the volume of what I call pointy objects. I have another video on what I call stackable objects, and if you haven't watched that one, I'd recommend you watch that first because I'm going to build on the concept that I laid down in that video when I'm talking about these pointy objects. Now before you pick up your textbook and look up the definition of a pointy object, you're not going to find it. This is how I think about these objects because there's an entire group of objects that your textbook will give you different formulas for, but if we zoom out a little bit, we can see that there's an entire higher class of three-dimensional objects that are essentially the same type of object and they all follow the same volume formula. These are the objects that I call pointy objects. In my stackable objects video, I talked about objects that you create by choosing a two-dimensional shape and stacking congruent versions of that shape on top of each other. The way you create a pointy object is you start with a two-dimensional shape and you stack up smaller and smaller versions of that shape until you get to a point. Importantly here, we are still stacking up two-dimensional shapes, but we're stacking up similar shapes, not congruent ones. Let me try to give you a visual of what I'm talking about. Imagine that we have a quarter on a table and we're looking at it from the side. If I want to create a stackable object, I can do that by putting another quarter on top and another quarter on top and another quarter on top. And I keep going until I reach whatever height I want. Now quarters are not two dimensional, quarters are three dimensional. So mathematically the trick here is that we can take all of these little sections that we're stacking and we can make them shorter. If we do that, then we have to add more of them to reach the same height, but that's okay. And you can see that as they get shorter and shorter, they become closer and closer closer to a two-dimensional object. And ultimately, what you get is just a stack of two-dimensional shapes that creates this three-dimensional solid object. Now, if I want to create a pointy object, I don't put another quarter on top of it. I have to put a slightly smaller circle, so a little bit smaller diameter. And then on top of that, I put a slightly smaller one again, and a slightly smaller and smaller one, and I keep going until I get to a point. The astute among you may say, hey, wait a minute, Mr. A, that's not quite a point. It's still flat on the top, and you're not wrong. But remember, we're not supposed to be stacking three-dimensional objects like quarters. We're supposed to be stacking two-dimensional objects like circles, which means this height would be zero. So the way we get this to be more and more like a mathematical pointy object is we make the height of these objects that we're stacking shorter and shorter, which of course means we need more of them, but that's okay. And as we get closer and closer to a zero height, we're essentially stacking up two two-dimensional circles, and now you can see I have a very nice smooth line, and it's pointy at the top. That's what makes it a pointy object. Before I leave this animation, I want to make one more point about stackable and pointy objects. So if you recall in the stackable video, we said it doesn't matter if you stack straight up or off to the right or the left or even in a spiral, and that's of course true for pointy objects too. If I were to stack them off to the right, it doesn't affect the volume. Those are still just quarters on the left, and they're smaller and smaller quarters on the right, but the volume doesn't change when I stack them off at an angle as opposed to straight up. Notice that we have this sawtooth kind of jagged edge here on both of these. There's this little staircase effect happening. But remember, we're stacking quarters here, and we're not supposed to stack three-dimensional objects. We're supposed to stack two-dimensional objects. So if I start to shorten these and make their height smaller and smaller, as that height gets closer and closer to zero, you see that what happens is the edges smooth out nicely, and I get nice smooth edges for my shapes here. So that's the idea mathematically of how we're stacking up these two-dimensional shapes. And it doesn't matter if I stack them straight up or off to the left or if I stack them up off to the right, the volume is going to be the same regardless of the direction of the stacking. Now that we understand what I mean when I say a pointy object versus stackable object, here's a question I'd like you to consider. On the left, I have a pointy object, which is called a right cylindrical cone. And on the right, I have a stackable object, which is called a cylinder. They both have the same diameter, 10 across, and they have the same height, 12. How much bigger do you think this cylinder is than this cone? Really think about that for a minute, maybe even just pause the video so that you get a gut response to this. In my experience, a lot of people's intuition tells them that the cylinder is going to be about twice as big as the cone. Surprisingly, it turns out to be three times as large. There is three times the volume in this cylinder than there is in this cone. If you were in class with me, I actually have a cylinder and a cone that I fill up with Rice Krispies. You can fill up this cone three times and dump all of those Rice Krispies into the cylinder. It's a pretty neat demonstration. And now here's the cool part. Not only is it exactly three for a cylinder and a cone, this relationship is the same for all pointy objects. That is to say, if I start with the same two-dimensional shape, this pointy object will always have one-third the volume of the original stackable object. Doesn't matter what the big B base was, whether you stack pentagons, squares, triangles, or any kind of a shape, when you stack to a point, you lose exactly two-thirds of the volume. The volume of a pointy object is always one-third the volume of a stackable object with the same big B base and height. In other words, big B base times height divided by three 
is the formula for the volume of any pointy object. At this point, you should be wondering, why one-third the volume? It's not at all obvious by looking at the shapes, and unfortunately, this is one of those times where in order to really answer this question, you're going to have to wait until you study calculus. If you stick around to the end of the video, I'm going to show you a really fascinating connection that actually ties this number one-third into higher dimensional geometry, but also lower dimensional geometry that you already know and understand. For now, I want to give you just a sense of why it's one-third, and then we'll work out some examples using the formulas. So here I have a cube. What I'm going to do is show you that there are actually three pyramids that make up this cube. The first one I'm going to get by looking at this bottom side of the cube and I'm going to stack that side on top of each other smaller and smaller up to this corner of the cube. That's this pyramid right here. So you can see that that pyramid is starting at the bottom, right? The Bigby base there is the bottom of the square and it stacks right up just into this one corner of the square. Now I'm going to take that pyramid out and I'll focus on this part of the cube, so this right side. I'm going to stack from that right side, again, smaller and smaller, up to that same point in the square. That'll give me this pyramid right here. So notice that that pyramid is connected only to the right-hand side of the square, and then it goes smaller and smaller squares up until the point there. If I put the right pyramid back, maybe you see where this is going. There's one open side left on this cube. I'm going to put a third pyramid in there, starting at this face and stacking up into that same corner. And here you can see that these three together completely fill up that cube. The original cube has a big B base that's a square and a height of the length of the side of that square. All three of these pyramids all have the same big B base, one side of the cube, and the same height, the length of the side of the cube. If the cube has the same big B base and height as the pyramids, and there are three of these pyramids that fit perfectly into the cube, then each of those pyramids has to be taking up one third of the volume of that cube. Pretty cool, right? It is really true that when you stack something up to a point, you end up with one third the volume of what would have been there if you stacked it straight up without going to a point. Remember, there's something much deeper happening here, so stick around for that. First, I want to show you a few examples where we just calculate the volume of some pointy objects, and at the end of that, I'll show you this deeper pattern that's going on. So here we have a pointy object. This one is a pyramid because we started with a polygon, a rectangle in this case, and then we stacked it smaller and smaller to a point. Notice that the height of this pyramid is 8. That means the height straight up and down. So remember, height always has to be at a right angle. In order to calculate the volume of a pointy object, we need to figure out what the base is. In this case, that's a rectangle, which means the Bigby base is simply 7 times 4, or 28. The volume of any pointy object is Bigby base times height over 3, which in this case is 28 times 8 divided by 3, or 224 thirds cubic centimeters. Here we have a cone. Now this one is a right circular cone because the point is straight above the middle, right? So it was stacked straight up. That's typically the type of cone you'll see in high school geometry, but it wouldn't matter if the point was over to the side. It's still going to be a stackable object. The first thing we want to do is always establish what the Bigby base shape is. For a cone, it's of course a circle that we're stacking up smaller and smaller to a point. That means that the Bigby base is pi r squared or pi times 5 squared, 25 pi. That's because with a diameter of 10, the radius is going to be just 5. We need to be careful about this 13. It's tempting to think that the 13 is the height of the cone, but it's not. Remember, height always needs to be at a right angle to the base. That's the height, which we actually don't know. This 13 is something called a slant height. We call it the slant height because it's the height of the slanted line that goes from the base up to the top. If this cone were like a pile of sand and you were going to hike up it or slide down it, the 13 would be how far you'd have to go. We need to figure out what h is, the actual height perpendicular to the base. Can you see how we're going to be able to do that? That right angle is a clue. There's a right triangle here. If we pull that triangle out of the cone and redraw it, since it's a right triangle, we can use good old Pythag to figure out what the height is. 5 squared plus h squared is 13, making h squared 144, so the height of this cone is 12. As with all pointy objects, the volume is the big B base times height divided by the 3, which in this case is 25 pi times 12 divided by 3, or 100 pi units cubed. In this one, we'll also have to take advantage of that right triangle that's sort of hidden inside of the pyramid. This actually comes up a lot with pointy objects, whether it be a cone or a pyramid. You often have a right triangle inside of it that you can use Pythag with to find some missing piece that you don't know. Here again, they're giving us the slant height of this pyramid, which is this distance down the outside edge. What we need to know is the height of the pyramid, which I'll mark in blue. In order to figure that out, we need to know this distance right here. Since the height comes straight down from the top of the pyramid right down to the center, this is going to be the center of this rectangle here. If this side is 8 inches all the way across, then half of that 4 inches is going to have to be this distance right here. If we pull that right triangle out of the pyramid and redraw it, I'll keep everything color-coded to make it easy to see where things came from. 
we can use Pythag to figure out the height. h squared plus 4 squared is 14 squared, which gives us h squared equal to 180, and h is the square root of 180. 180 is the same as 36 times 5, which means this is the square root of 36 times the square root of 5, which simplifies to 6 radical 5. Since the base is a rectangle, the big B base is just length times width, or 10 times 8, 80. Like all pointy objects, the volume of our pyramid is big B base times height divided by 3, which in this case is 80 times 6 radical 5 divided by 3, which is 160 rad 5 inches cubed. One last example here. The fact that it's a square base pyramid tells us that this 9.2 is also the length over here, and this 13 yards we have to be extra careful with because that's not the height of the pyramid, but it's also not the slant height. It's the length of this edge that the 13 is along. Now this is a little bit tricky the first time you see it, so let's try to break this down. The slant height would actually be from the point at the top down the side. This would be the slant height of this pyramid. The slant height is technically defined as the line that goes along the face of the pyramid perpendicular to the base at the bottom. This 13 is from the top of the pyramid down to this far right corner of the base, and the height actually isn't even part of this triangle. I'm going to add the height to this picture so you can see where it is. Remember, the height always needs to be perpendicular to the base, straight down from the tip right to the center of the base. And if we connect that point there, you can see there's a right triangle there. So the height in purple forms a right triangle that has the slant height as the hypotenuse. But the slant height, we don't know. It's a side of another right triangle where this 13 is the hypotenuse. So we're actually going to need to use both of these right triangles to work out the volume of this pyramid. Let's deal with the triangle with the slant height first. Since this is a square base, if this is 9.2 yards, this is 9.2 yards all the way across, and this piece is going to be half of that, 4.6 yards. If I pull that triangle out of the picture, we have a right triangle with 4.6 as one leg, 13 is the hypotenuse, and the other leg is the slant height of this triangle. And we can use Pythag. L squared plus 4.6 squared is 13 squared, which means L squared ends up being 147.84, and the square root of that is about 12.15894732. We want to use all of these decimals because we're in the middle of the problem, so we don't want to round here, so I'll just store those on my calculator and use those for later. Now that we know what the slant height is, we can move to this other triangle. This other triangle is another right triangle that has the height of the pyramid in it. So we're going to use Pythag one more time, which gives us h squared plus 4.6 squared equal to l squared, where l is the slant height, remember. That means h squared is 126.68, and h is about 11.255-22101. Again, I will store that in my calculator because I do not want to round this early in the problem. Now that we know the height of the pyramid itself, we can go ahead and calculate the volume. Of course, the Bigby base is this square. They actually told us that in the beginning of the problem. Its area is just side squared, so the Bigby base is 84.64. The volume, of course, of any pointy object is Bigby base times height divided by 3. That's 84.64 times the height divided by 3, or 317.5 cubic yards, approximately. Notice I just wrote h here when I was working out the volume formula. That's because I stored this number in my calculator. This h is this whole number here, the 11.255-22101. I'm just not writing it all out. Storing numbers in your calculator is a really handy way to keep the work on your page clean. That's really everything you need to know to find the volumes of pointy objects. All you do is think about what the big B base is, and then times it by the height and divide by 3. It's always one-third of the volume of what you would have gotten if you just stacked congruent objects on top of each other like you would with a stackable object. If you stuck around this long, I'm hoping that you want to see that deeper pattern I was talking about earlier. So let's try to uncover a little bit more about what's going on with this one-third of the volume pattern that we're seeing in these pointy objects. At this point, we should be pretty comfortable and familiar with a 3D cone. That is to say, an object that you get by taking a circle and stacking smaller and smaller circles until you reach a point. What if I were to ask you to think about a 2D cone? What would that look like? What could that look like? Well, let's look for a pattern here. Our three-dimensional cone we obtained by taking a two-dimensional object, the circle, and stacking it in a third dimension, the height. Right, so the circle, the Bigby base, has a length and a width, and we stacked it in the third dimension, height. So a two-dimensional cone, if we're following the same pattern, would have to start with a one-dimensional object that you stack smaller and smaller versions of it up a certain height. Can you think of anything like that? How about a triangle? You've probably never thought about a triangle like this before. Imagine a triangle as a pointy object, but one dimension lower. So if you took a line segment, and then you put a little bit shorter line segment on top, and then a little bit shorter line segment on top, and you kept stacking line segments on top of line segments, wouldn't that build a triangle in the exact same way that stacking two-dimensional circles smaller and smaller builds a cone? 
So a triangle is in fact a pointy object, but it's a two-dimensional pointy object. In two dimensions, of course, we don't have volume, we have area. The area of a triangle is one half base times height, and I'm going to rewrite that as base times height divided by two. Let's recall what the formula for a 3D cone's volume is. Does anything jump out at you there? For the triangle, we have a one-dimensional base, we stack it to a certain height, and we divide by two to get the area. That's a two-dimensional cone. For a volume of a three-dimensional cone, we have a two-dimensional base, we stack it in a third dimension, the height, and we divide by three to get the volume. That's a 3D cone. What's happening here is that as we make those objects smaller and smaller up to a point, we go from three dimensions all the way to zero dimensions at the very top. Remember that a point is a zero-dimensional object. The volume that would have been there if we stacked straight up gets split up evenly between those three dimensions. And what you're left with is one third of the volume that you would have had. Big B base times height divided by three. The same thing is happening in a triangle. When you start with a one dimensional line and you stack it up in another dimension, height, up to a point, the two dimensions get collapsed all the way to just zero dimensions at the top there. And the area that you would have had, the extra area here if you stack the same congruent line segment on top, get split up evenly between those two dimensions. That's why we divide by two. But that should raise a question in your mind. If what we normally think of as a cone is a three-dimensional cone, and a triangle can be thought of as a two-dimensional cone, what about something like a four-dimensional cone? Is that even possible? Can you have a four-dimensional anything? Well, if you're in my class, you know that mathematically there's nothing wrong with higher dimensions. It might not be possible to have a 4D cone in reality, but mathematically there's nothing wrong with that. The volume of a four-dimensional cone would be big B base times height divided by four, where that big B base is actually a three-dimensional object. If you want to create a four-dimensional cone, you need to start with a three-dimensional object, say a cube, and then stack smaller and smaller cubes on top of it, but in another direction, a new dimension for a certain height. Now, we can't picture that because we live in three dimensions, but if you could do it, the volume that you would get st stacking the same cube on top of itself would be divided between all four dimensions equally, and you would get a cone that is exactly one-fourth of the volume of what you would have had if you stack the same cube on top of itself in that fourth dimension. And we can actually extend this pattern as far as we want to. Mathematically, there's nothing holding us back from going to any number of dimensions. So in general, an n-dimensional cone has a volume equal to big B base times height divided by n, where the big B base is always one less dimension and the height is always one dimension. That's how we get to n dimensions. We have n minus one dimensions here times one more dimension for the height that we stack that shape into. Hopefully you find that as fascinating as I do. One of the most amazing things to me about mathematics is when we can move beyond the physical world and abstract into realities that we can only imagine. Hopefully you found that enjoyable as well. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, subscribe to my channel, feel free to leave a comment below, and as always, have a great day.